Since the dawn of civilization, spies of every nation and culture have worked to infiltrate their adversaries and glean the information that will give their side the advantage. The stakes are sky high, the strategies varied and imaginative, and the ultimate sign of success is that no one ever even knew you were there. In each episode, we will explore the moral and ethical gray zones of espionage, where treachery and betrayal go hand in hand with cunning and courage. This is the Spycraft 101 podcast. Welcome to your clandestine classroom. This is episode number 92 of the Spycraft 101 podcast. Today, I'm speaking with Norman Ridley. Norman is a retired businessman and graduate of Open University in the United Kingdom and lives in the Channel Islands. Since retiring a few years ago, he's pursued his passion for history by publishing books so far on World War II. He's also got three more in the works right now to be published soon. I invited Norman onto the podcast to discuss his book, The Venlo Sting, about a fascinating counterespionage incident which occurred right at the beginning of the war. Two senior members of British intelligence were ensnared in a German trap in Venlo, Netherlands in November 1939. Their capture dealt a major blow to the British intelligence establishment just as the largest war in history was beginning. It's a fascinating look at the cat and mouse game played between two very capable agencies at odds with each other. But before we get into this story of German counterespionage during World War II, I want to ask you, the listener, a question. Has this podcast given you a renewed interest in the history of the Cold War? Do you want to share that interest with others? Well, now there's a fun and interactive way to introduce your family and friends to the topic. I'm talking about 15-Minute Cold War, a new strategy-based card game. With the two expansion packs currently available, or using the brand new Complete Edition, up to 10 players can battle each other for global domination. As one of the great powers during the Cold War, use your armed forces to attack opponents while defending yourself with military, scientific, and economic assets. There are also wild cards based on real events and people to keep things interesting. For example, how will Oleg Pankowski weaken one side or strengthen another? Players don't have to know any history to start playing, just learn the color codes and point values of each card. My eight-year-old daughter understood the game mechanics within a few minutes and has already won two rounds against her mom and I. You can also use the new speed tokens to boost the rate of play by up to 50% for large multiplayer games for when the Cold War turns hot. If you've heard me mention 15-minute Cold War before, there are two brand new updates you should know about. Starting now, any order for more than $50 gets free worldwide shipping. And if you use the discount code SPYCRAFT101, you'll get 15% off your entire order. Find it at 15mincoldwar.com. That's 15mincoldwar.com. And make sure to follow at 15minutecoldwar on Instagram. Norman, thank you for taking the time to sit down with me today. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. I'm glad to hear it. I first learned about the Venlo Sting last year, and I knew that it would make a great discussion. So I was very excited to find out that you had written a book on it very recently and that we were able to connect like this. Okay. So on that note, because you've written a number of books about World War II in the past, and this is a somewhat relatively overlooked incident, what was it that led you to write about the Venlo Sting in the first place? Well, as you said, I, I'd written books before, and the Venlo Sting was actually my fifth book. And I find when I'm researching and writing a book, I often come across a subject which is sort of, comes across peripherally, you might say, that is on the edge of the narrative that I'm working on, but which is really interesting enough to deserve a whole book all by itself. And so that really just makes me want to learn more about it. And the next book just sort of comes out of that and sort of seems to take over when the last one left off. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> it's not always like that, but that was certainly the way with the Venable book. Hmm. I, can, I can definitely understand that. I haven't written or published a complete book on a single subject like you have, but certainly in my research, I'm constantly finding something else. That's and right. it's so that's interesting right. that it yeah. makes me want to pause what I'm doing and work on that instead for a little while. So I, I think you know exactly what that's like as well. Yeah. 
Well, the book I was working on when the Venlo idea came up was the one called Reading Hitler's Mind. That was about British and German intelligence the way that the intelligence agencies had prepared their leaders for the Munich conference. So there was a, a flow of legitimate dissidents who were leaving Germany as well as still inside Germany and still inside the German establishment at that time. So the idea of this dissident that was dangled to them by German intelligence, that was not just tantalizing, but it was based in in fact, I guess. Is that correct? I couldn't be sure whether he was connected to it or not. So I know that British intelligence, they had a they have a, a very good reputation for how they handled themselves in many aspects of the war, by the end of the war in particular. Right. Um, yes, you know, they were very good at no. Right, right. That's what I was going to ask is yeah. how, how were they prepared for the war compared to how they developed and evolved over the course of the war? Were they prepared for this type of complex operation, this kind of, of dangle operation, as mentioned, or did they just kind of buy it hook, line, and sinker? They were underfunded and overstretched in about 1936. They had three major issues which were really stretching them beyond their capabilities. They were having a devil of a time. The first thing really was Palestine. Arabs and Jews were threatening war in Palestine. The British had 20,000 troops in Palestine trying to keep, trying to keep the peace. And they were desperate. MI6 really were concentrated on the Middle East at this time. They, were, they weren't actually, they hadn't really refocused on Germany in about 1936. And the other thing, of hmm. course, in 1936 was the Spanish Civil War. That started no, out as just a, an internal coup d'etat by Franco, which got off to a very bad start. For him, he called Italy and Germany in to help him out. They started sending logistics, basically, to start with. But then the government called on the Soviet Union for help. The socialist government called on the Soviet Union. And the Union, Soviet Union started sending in hardware, tanks, airplanes, so... Germans and Italians didn't have much choice but to follow suit. And before long, there was a full bloody shooting war going on, which took the British completely by surprise. They didn't have any agents on the ground in Spain. They had no real contacts there. They hadn't really got a clue what was going on. And the thing was that the Soviets and the Germans and the Italians to some extent were showing off all their latest hardware and and military tactics, which is almost as important. And the British were desperate to have somebody in Spain to, you know, report back on this because it was quite important for the British military to understand these new tactics. But there was nobody there. They didn't have anybody. So that was really playing on them as well. And then after 1936, the government, the British government, were getting really panicky about the Germans, especially the Luftwaffe. British had been told that the bomber will always get through. That's what kept them awake at night, thinking about that. They needed intelligence on the size of the Luftwaffe, bomber force, numbers, capabilities, what aircraft are in in the process of development. And that was the other thing that MI6 was asked to find out about, get agents in there, find out what was going on. So those were the three hmm. major issues that they were, they were faced with, and they really weren't in any position to handle any one of them, one of them all three at the same time. Yeah, my goodness, certainly had their hands full at the worst possible time when they needed to be laser-focused, it, it seems like to me. So yeah. what about the, the German intelligence, the Abwehr, the, the German SD? Were they, did they have separate strengths or were they also 
very stretched thin with all of the things that were going on for Germany at the same time? Well, the SD was the intelligence arm of Hitler's SS. It had been around in one form or another since about 1931. By 1931, by 1939, the, the SS controlled pretty much every aspect of German life. Essentially, Hitler's private army, absolute powers, with their, their role really was to eradicate all opposition to the Nazi regime. That was the mm -hmm. SS intelligence. There was also the military intelligence, which was the other which is run by Canaris. It had actually been Canaris' second-in-command, Hans Oster, who had led the plot against Hitler pre the Czech crisis. So the Abwehr really was more on the side of the army than it was on the side of Hitler and the SS. And okay. The plane, so the what is it then the SD that put together this sting operation in Venlo? We'll be right back. Hello nerds. Come listen to the History Nerds United podcast and let's make history fun again. We interview today's best authors whether they are established Pulitzer Prize winners or someone debuting their first book. Let us show you that history is not a boring class you took in high school, but a place where the best stories come from. And we don't just cover history. We also love to chat about true crime, biographies, memoirs, and so much more. So head on over to History Nerds United and let us introduce you to your new favorite book and learn the story behind the story. History Nerds United. Yeah, well, to start with, I don't think. If we sort of go back and think about where it all started with Fisher. Fisher was, well, this is a spy story, as you know. So you and your listeners won't be surprised to find out that Fisher, who Fisher was and who he claimed to be were two quite different things. Mm -hmm. Fisher is one of the main characters here. He, I don't think he was working for the SD to begin with. He, I think he was just a chancer. He was... He was a crook, certainly, and he was just scraping around to see if he could pick up any sort of bits of information that might be useful, something he could sell, something he could use. So he first shows up in Paris, well, as far as the British are concerned, he first shows up in Paris in about 1938. He was a German emigre in Paris, fairly low value British agent called. Carl Speaker, he had contacts with other German emigres in Paris. He'd been there since about 1933. Um, he knew them, they knew him. And Fisher turned up and contacted Speaker. Now, Speaker should have been a little bit more wary about what was going on. He wasn't very good, actually. The MI6 had recruited him, thinking he might be useful to help to set up an intelligence cell inside Germany. But he was pretty hopeless. <laughs> it, they lost interest in him, really. But he wasn't lost off the radar entirely. There's another guy who thought he might use him, another Englishman, called... Claude Marshbanks Danzi. So Danzi told Speaker that he also worked for British intelligence. Well, that was true, but not quite the way that Speaker thought it was true. It was a bit more complicated than that. Danzi had actually been handed out of MI6 on trumped up charges. And as far as anybody knew, he'd been thrown out on his ear in disgrace. That was a story that was put about, but the reality was quite different. Sinclair was panicking a bit in 1936. The British government sent a rocket up his shirt telling him to shape up. 
but he knew that his European operation, which was centered in Holland, was really not fit for purpose. It had been infiltrated over the years, almost since the end of the First World War. German double agents, French agents, Dutch double agents, it was a mess for me. Mm -hmm. wow. So, Sinclair did two things. First of all, he brought in a new man to take over the reins in Rotterdam. And the other thing he did was to get rid of Danzig, probably his top agent. At least he gave the impression he got rid of Danzig, but he didn't clear him. Danzig hadn't been given a chop. What had happened was that Sinclair had set up a shadow intelligence agency in total secrecy, completely separate from mainstream operations. They called it or something better, they called it the Z organization. Danzig was in charge of it. He recruited clean agents and they operated from headquarters in Switzerland, not in Holland. But only the only two people who knew about this were Sinclair and Danzig. Nobody wow. else in MI6 knew what was going on. Otherwise, there was no point. It wouldn't have been secret anymore. But the only way it could mm -hmm. really be effective is if it was secret. So Danzig recruited, recruited hard businessmen who moved in and out of Germany with contacts with German industry, journalists traveling through Germany and elsewhere, academics with links to German universities, all that sort of thing. So Danzig was their cutoff. They really didn't know who Danzig was working for. They knew he was working for the British, but he didn't. They didn't know what his link with MI6 was. And he didn't tell them. So he'd more or less pick speaker up just because he was there, because you never quite know how useful people might be. He was available, so he may have just put him on the books. What he got him doing was just reporting back on the emigres that contacted him in, Ger in, in Paris, the German emigres that were coming in. Because some of them, you know, some of them might turn out to be useful. And some of them might be uh, Agent provocateur, so it was important to keep an eye on them as well. A lot of them might be neither that useful nor provocateur, but then again, some of them might be both. So, mm -hmm. any one of these categories might turn out to be a valuable source of intelligence or might be useful. So, Danzi had got to speak of just keeping an eye on things, kept his ear to the ground, his nose in the air, sort of thing. And it was then that he came into contact with Fisher. Actually, Fisher contacted him. Should have been an alerted speaker, but he wasn't all that perceptive. He took Fisher at face value. So what Fisher told speaker was that he was on the run from the German police. He'd been uh, accused of embezzlement. He said it was a false charge because he stood up the local Nazis in Salisi where he lived and they trumped up charges against him to shut him up or get rid of him. And they, they were looking to lock him up. So he'd gone on the run, he said. He went to Switzerland and the Swiss kicked him out and he ended up in Paris. There was nothing unusual about that. It was happening all the time. And Fisher told Speaker that he had a letter of introduction signed to uh, make speaker think that he was legit. A letter from a man called Emil Ludwig, who had been known to help German dissidents in the past. And the speaker thought that was you know, feasible. And then Fisher sort of intimated the speaker that he might have some information, something that might be valuable to the 
the British the company it worked for had been a fuel distributor. So obviously that was important in the German economy and we thought maybe we had enough information to make the to interest the British. It might be worth a few. So he asked speak out if he thought the British might be interested. Well, Speaker didn't know, but he thought maybe. So Fisher asked Speaker if he knew anybody who could put him in contact with the British. Obviously, Fisher knew all about Speaker, but he wasn't let him on. So, well, Speaker thought, you know, that was possible. And Fisher wondered if Speaker might consider making inquiries, making contacts. Well, right. Of course he did. He passed the details on to Danzy. And Danzy thought he was worth having, worth having a look at fishing just to see what he was made of. Hmm. So at this point, since you mentioned that Fisher stored it, kind of started everything out on his own, at this point, was he being directed to do this by anyone or was he just building these contacts on his own before he went back to the German intelligence? I'm not sure. He had been picked up by the Gestapo in Paris. Ah. He... And they had offered him a deal. Either he could work for them and report back on German emigres, what German emigres were doing in Paris, what there were people like Speaker report back. Or they would haul him back to Silesia to stand trial for what she said he hadn't done. <laughs> so he didn't really have much choice. So he'd he'd gone in touch with Speaker, and Speaker had gone in touch with Danzi. Well, Danzi went to take a look at Fisher. He, well, he didn't go himself. He sent somebody to go and have a chat to Fisher. Thought he might just pull a thread and see what unraveled, if you like. So. The man he chose to start Fisher out to see what he was made of was an ex MI6 agent living in Holland, somebody that Danzi had known and worked with since the First World War. He was a businessman living in Holland, in Rotterdam, very well connected, a man called Sigismund. Paying Best, French called him C. Best had a German wife, lots of German friends, German contacts, aristocratic mostly, Prussian junker class, living in northern Germany, all of whom were getting their noses pushed out by the Nazis. They didn't like the Nazis. They were more than welcome to, they were more than willing to to liaise with uh, with Best. Hmm. And Best was a strange character, very English, or English twins. He spoke perfect German, but he insisted on speaking German with a a very broad English accent. Give in to it at all. Words were right, everything, but it was English pronunciation. He wasn't going to lower himself to the German princess. <laughs> and he wore a monocle, which he thought made him look a bit more aristocratic. Not sure if he knew it or not, but it made him look a bit more distinguished. Hmm. He had, apart from this sort of demeanor which he gave off, he had quite a reputation during the First World War for being particularly ruthless. Killing people agents on the spot when they found out sort of thing. He was fairly really? he, wasn't, you know, he wasn't too interested mm-hmm. in procedure. If he thought somebody was a bad man, he would uh, get rid of them. 
no longer had any license for that sort of thing, but then he kept him on the books because, you know, those people could be useful in certain situations. Mm -hmm. I was just going to ask, is he, was he chosen for this because he was already in the Netherlands or was he probably the best man regardless to evaluate Fisher's claims? I think Danzi had a high opinion of Bess. As I said, he worked with him during the First World War and he kept in touch with him all through the 20s, early 30s. Best was probably feeding back the intelligence he had got from his contacts in northern Germany. He was a very useful man and a very capable man, there's no question. But he was getting on a bit. He wasn't as young as he used to be. And maybe he'd lost a bit of his fire. So, Danzig thought he was the best man to look at Fisher. He trusted his judgment. And best met Fisher and didn't really like what he saw. Didn't think there was much truth in his story. Likeable enough, a nice enough chap, the sort of chap you would, you know, have a glass of wine with and chat about today's goings on, but best found him a bit shifty, if you know the name. That kind of expression is in America, shifty. Hmm. It, so uh, best was well trusted at the time. And he didn't take a liking to Fisher at all. So why was correct. that not the end of things then? Correct. So he thought Fisher was just out to pick up any scraps of intelligence he could and feed them back to whoever he could sell it with, sell them to. He was uh, just a bit of a stooge. Best had seen plenty of that sort of people in his time. He advised Danzi to invite Fisher to London on the pretext of negotiations. And then he said the best thing that Danzi could do would be lock him up for the duration. Hmm. And it's a pity Danzi didn't take his advice. So they, they wow. obviously didn't, they, best didn't know that Fisher was working for the Germans, but he didn't think that he was on the level. So Danzi didn't really want to take it any further with Fisher. He kept him on the payroll running, I think, a little smuggling operation into Holland. Just kept him on, on the lead for the moment. He didn't really want to set him, he wanted to keep an eye on him because he would be really trusting. And then Danzi went off to Switzerland, back to his headquarters in Switzerland, and basically forgot about Fisher. But back in London, MI6 Chief Sinclair, he was in a bad way, close to death, cancer of the liver, I think. So his second in command, a man called Menace, was running things, and Danzi had to report to him now. So Menace was brought into the secret about the Z organization. He didn't like Danzi, he didn't like the Z organization, which had been set up without him knowing about it. And the other thing was that. Mengus thought he was a shoe in for Sinclair's job when he eventually died. But he also thought that Danzi had his eye on it as well. So that was another reason that he wasn't particularly well disposed towards Danzi's organization. But Mengus did know, Danzi probably didn't, that Chamberlain and Halifax had again been getting these. German emissaries with hints about what might or might not, might not happen if they, if they stood up against Hitler and what the Germans wanted to know basically was if the army deposed, remember Britain and France were at war with German Germany, they wanted to know that if they could 
topple Hitler, would the British agree to peace talks immediately? So, yeah, I can see how that desire kind of trumped everything else at that time. Yeah, absolutely. Chamberlain did not want another war. He'd been in the first war. He'd, he'd served on the battlefield. He'd seen, he'd seen terrible things. He desperately wanted to avoid another war. So this was clutching at straws, but, you know, straws are pretty much all he had. Mm -hmm. When Mengus heard through the Z organization, which he was now running, about Fisher, with his story, we've actually jumped a bit here. When Best spoke to Fisher, when he interviewed him, Fisher had immediately changed his story. He told Best that he knew people in the army, he had contacts, who had contacts, who had contacts. He knew that the German army might be willing to negotiate with the British behind Hitler's back. And when Menes heard about this, he, he just wondered maybe if that was part of the bigger picture. If this was just another thread, another read that the Germans were putting out to try and create this, this compact against Hitler. And if that was true, and Danzi had turned him down, and if Mengus found that Fisher was, then that would certainly work in his favour and put in Danzi for the top job. So Danzi now brought another man in because he, he wanted best to follow up on Fisher, and he wanted best to have more resources. So he wanted best to make contact with British intelligence in Rotterdam and use their resources. Now the new man in Rotterdam was a man called Fisher, uh, beg your pardon, Stevens, Richard Stevens. Stevens was the man that Sinclair had brought in in 36 to try and clean up the operation in Holland. It was a bad choice. Stevens had spent all his working life in, in intelligence in the Middle East. He spoke about six Middle Eastern languages. Hadn't done anything in Europe at all. Didn't understand the European situation. He'd actually got to go to, when Sinclair gave him the job, he'd actually had to send him to Paris for a three, four months to work with French intelligence, museum bureau, to bring him up to speed with what, what was really happening. Hmm. My gosh. Uh, so he was a, was Stevens then a fairly talented guy? He was just focused on the wrong region or was he also not very capable in, in he any aspect? He certainly had talents. He certainly had talents, which, like I said, he spoke six languages. He was used to... Mm -hmm. uh, dealing with people in the Middle East. But when it actually came down to it, in Europe, the issue was Germany, the Nazis, and Hitler, which was a completely different world. And I don't think Stevens really understood that. He, he couldn't adjust in time to deal with the situation there. Hmm. And he wasn't very happy when Best was forced in Holland. He knew Best. He met Best in Rotterdam. He was, Best was a, he was a musician. He, he used to give little concerts to his friends. And, and it was a, in the English community, so Stevens had come across him. He had no idea that Best was working for dancing. No idea that Best was working for British intelligence in a different capacity. And when he was told that he had to put all his resources at Best's disposal, he certainly wasn't too happy about it. <laughs> I bet. So, Stevens was the weak link. He brought in a clean pair of hands, but he didn't really have a grip on things. 
Hmm. So Best went back to Fisher, kidded him along, telling him he, you know, made the, made out that he believed what he was saying. Tried to find out more about him and about what contacts he had, might or might not have had. So now Fisher started naming names, German generals. So that's uh, best practicing us up at that, of course. And Fisher also said that he had a liaison, a man, an officer in the Luftwaffe, one called Sons, Major Sons. He was prepared to meet Bess and bring messages from the generals. Well, Bess didn't really think much of that, you know. I didn't, couldn't really figure out what a Luftwaffe officer was doing in the middle of all this. Luftwaffe and the army didn't really get on, they didn't feel like they were in the same room together. But he, he had to meet Soames, he'd been told to follow it up. He was up following orders and he went to, he agreed to meet Soames. Fisher said... Well, it's amazing how there's so many little things that stand out to us now, but they, I guess they weren't quite all put together at the time because of the priorities well, on ending this war quickly if possible. That's the way things are. You have separate, separate things, separate events. Separate issues don't look like they're anything at all. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, when you put them all together, they start to make a picture. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's happened many, many times over the years. At the time, this is what intelligence is about, really, is analyzing snippets of information, putting things together, and trying to see what the bigger picture is. Mm -hmm. But these were you know, early days, and, and MI6 at that time didn't really have the resources for that sort of thing. Anyway. Best decided, no, he didn't decide, he agreed to meet Solms. Fisher said Solms wouldn't come to Rotterdam. Too dangerous. He wanted to meet somewhere close to the border so he could just sort of nip across and be back again in time for tea. Okay. So, again, Best didn't think much of that. Particularly, he didn't like the idea of a Luftwaffe officer getting involved. He couldn't see where the colonel was going to fit into the picture. But he agreed anyway. He was an experienced field man. He had a lot of confidence. He had been in some very sticky situations in his time. He didn't think that it was going to be anything that he couldn't handle. And, of course, this was an extra step up from Fisher, so he really needed to know about Soames. Who was he? How did he fit in? Whether he was somebody else just playing a game or whether there was something behind him. So they had two meetings, Best and Soames, probably more than two. Didn't get very far. Soames dangled a few snippets of intelligence mostly Luftwaffe intelligence in front of Best to try and convince him that he was willing to play. He wasn't of much interest in Best. Then Storm started asking questions the second third meeting. He wanted to know what arrangements would be made to accommodate the generals. How would they be handled when they came across? Who would they meet? Where would the meetings be? How far up the chain of command on the British side would it go? Was it going on? Was it foreign office that was involved? This was, he was starting to fish now for information about the British. Best didn't like that. But he, Still didn't think Fisher and Soames were much of a danger. He, again, he thought they were just a couple of chances out to make a bit of money for themselves. A menace hmm. in London was told about this, of course. 
And I don't know if it's got quite excited, actually. They just heard a rumor that General Fritsch, who had been a long time opponent of the Nazis, had been assassinated by the Gestapo. It wasn't true. This is a rumor that they heard, and they thought that this might be something, you know, there might be something going on. Maybe something has started stirring, and this friction between the army and the Gestapo ESS was starting to build up. Fritz had actually been shot on the battlefield in Poland. He was hit by a stray bullet and bled to death on the battlefield. The other thing was that there's a lot of rumors flying about about what the SS had been doing in Poland after the invasion. Again, as I mentioned before, the mass murders, the execution squads, landing of political leaders, and just executing them. But on the British side, the Foreign Office told Mengus, yes, go ahead. This is important stuff. It could, it could be part of a bigger picture. And Fisher actually went as far as the British War Cabinet and got approval from them to carry on. So this was authorized now from the very highest level of British politics. My gosh, things really got some momentum behind it, but all yeah, but of the it, people uh, that, it's from well, people that just don't have any contact with him. It had all come from innuendo, rumor, low life, people like Fisher. There was, there was really no, no high level input from the Germans at this time at all. But because the British had taken it seriously, the Dutch, the Dutch worked very closely with the British. The Dutch had a very, very small intelligence outfit, almost non-existent. They relied on the British and the French to feed them information. And in return, they allowed the British and French intelligence agencies to act fairly freely in Holland. Hmm. But they still wanted, they were a bit worried that things might be getting out of hand, so they assigned a liaison officer to them, a Dutch officer called Dirk Klopp. He was now to accompany Best and Stevens to any further meetings with German dissidents. He, as you probably know, but the Dutch people speak very good English, always have done. It's almost second language to most Dutch people. But he was able to appear to be a British officer along with Best and Stevens, who didn't show himself up as being Dutch. Mm, okay. But his job was to make sure that things didn't get out of hand and cause diplomatic incident and cause the Dutch government any embarrassment. Because the Germans, mm. the, the Dutch were panicking that the, the, the Germans were going to attack them more or less on a daily basis. They, they, were, they were very on edge about it. So they didn't want the British to provoke the Germans. So this got to the point it was starting to get a bit more than it started out as. And then we get two more characters coming in at this point, Reinhard Heydrich and Heinrich Himmler, who started to take an interest in what was going on. So it was starting to get a bit high powered on the German side as well. They had two. Oh my gosh, yeah, those are names that are familiar to everyone. Yeah. So Himmler and Heydrich come into the picture now. Heydrich was head of SD. Him, of course, was head of SS overall. Heydrich was head of intelligence. And he would have been getting briefings from a man called Nocken, Helmut Nocken, at the foreign intelligence desk of SD, who was actually behind the original blackmailing of Fisher. So Fisher actually 
was working for Nocken in a very low capacity. He wasn't, I don't think when Nocken set him up in Paris to meet speaker that you thought he was pretty much it, very much in it. You didn't think he was going to get a lot out of it, but it was a way of things that you, 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 you just put people in place and see what turns up. But now, of course, best with Best and Stevens taking the bait, as it were. Every day, you're under attack, whether you realize it or not. Your digital devices contain your entire life, your finances, your conversations with friends and family, your interests, and even your movements. And all of that is vulnerable to an ever-expanding class of criminals, scam artists, hackers, and even governments. You don't want to leave your data security entirely in the hands of your ISP or anyone else for that matter. It's up to you to protect yourself using a multi-layered defense strategy. Silent offers you the protection you need to keep your data and devices secure from wireless threats. Their multi-shield technology blocks cellular signals, GPS, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, EMP, RFID, NFC, and more. Silence lineup includes everything from signal blocking wallets all the way up to 40 cubic liter Faraday duffel bags. When you're geared up with Silent, you'll be truly disconnected, undetectable, untraceable, and unhackable. And you can now use the discount code SPYCRAFT101 to save 10% off your order from Silent. Find them at slnt.com. That's slnt.com. And having all these meetings with the Germans, with, with Solms and Fischer, not going to realize that the British were starting to take it seriously. And when he told Heydrich, Heydrich's nose twitched and he thought, couldn't be any harm in playing this up a little bit just to see how far it would go. How far up line in British intelligence for an office would the British be prepared to deal? It would give him a lot of information about the British mindset, about how well prepared they were for getting into a fighting war, how desperate they were for peace. So Heydrich could see something in this. Himmler, on the other hand, had his own ambitions. Himmler didn't particularly want war. It was messy and unpredictable. And it could all go very badly wrong. He was sitting pretty much where he wanted to be. He had all these draconian powers over the population and he was making quite a lot of money as well. Power and money, he had pretty much everything the man wanted. Mm -hmm. So, when Hitler started making noises about going to war with France, even talking about attacking Russia, Himmler wasn't very happy about that. He didn't think that there was any point in that. He thought that what you should do, where Hitler was now, he should just consolidate, take what he'd got, consolidate, and then negotiate from there, negotiate from the position of strength. With Hitler, like I said before, Hitler was a gambler, he was a chancellor, he didn't want that. He wanted more, and he wanted it quickly, and the only way to do that was to invasion, military invasion, take over by force. So Himmler really was not averse to the idea of getting rid of Hitler, because he thought that he could he was the ideal man to take his place. Hitler was in power because the SS protected him. He was his private army. And dissent in the country was clamped down on extremely hard, as you know. 
Hitler was ambitious. He thought if he could take over from Hitler, he could negotiate with the British. He could draw a, a larger Germany, Austria, Czechoslovakia, Poland, and more or less, as I said, consolidate and, 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 and go, go and advance from diplomacy. So he was keen to see how far the British would go to get rid of Hitler. And he thought he wasn't averse to giving him a hand. So hmm. now... I third, guess there's a lot of factors in play here. Yeah, a third guy comes in now, which is a man who works for Heidrich, Walter Schellenberg. Schellenberg survived the war. He was not tried at Nuremberg. He served prison sentences. But there's a picture of him taken while he was in Allied custody after the war. And this picture shows him with a sly grin on his face. He's got the board, you know, with the number on everything, is the mugshot. And he's got this sly grin on his face, which is really quite telling, I think. He was very smart, very intelligent. But he also, you feel, had this wry sense of humor. He possibly was a bit of a joker, like sending people. But he was ambitious as well. And he was also on the lookout for something that could put him another step up the promotion ladder. Anyway, Heydrich assigned him to take over the Fisher operation. I told him, just let it play out, see how far the British will go to avoid getting into a fighting war. To get an idea of what was going on, Schellen, Schellenberg decided that he would go to the next meeting himself with the British. But incognito. It's really a sign of how likely the Germans were still taking it. They weren't convinced that there was anything in it. And Schellenberg was having a bit of a laugh. He called himself Hauptmann Schemmel. Schemmel was actually a real German officer, but he was serving in Poland at the time. And strangely, Schellenberg decided that when he went to the next meeting, he would wear a monocle as well. Because apparently Schemmel wore a monocle. Hmm. Just in case the British knew about Schemmel, he thought he should wear one. Not a particularly clever thing to do because wearing a monocle, unless you're used to it, it's not an easy thing to do. You better screw your <laughs> face imagine. up and it keeps falling out and that sort of thing. So well, it was a it was a bit of a lark, really, I think. When he went to the meeting, they had a meeting. It was actually in a car. They didn't get out of the car. So Best didn't really get a chance to look at him too closely, see what games he was playing. So they had a couple of meetings. Schellenberg, Best, Stevens, the Klops of the standing guard. Germans wanted to know how far the chain of command Authorized had been given, authorization had been given. They wanted to know who on the British side was going to negotiate with the Germans, what rank would they have, which department would they be with. The British were still trying to find out which Germans were really in on the plot, and they were, what they really wanted to know most of all was when one of these German generals is actually going to show up. Yeah, it's amazing to me that Fisher was able to kind of string them along for so long without producing anything of substance, right? Yeah, but he hadn't fooled best. It was it was coming from the from the Foreign Office and from the government, which is where the pressure was coming to take Fisher seriously. They right, were, I really feel for best. 
he's sitting there with a guy he doesn't believe him, presumably, and everybody above him is telling, no, 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 this guy is legit. You have to keep meeting with him over and over again. It's it's well, hard to imagine his frustration. Yeah, maybe they didn't say he was legit, but they thought he might be. And they were, mm -hmm. they were prepared to take the risk. And, and best was the Patsy who they'd send out there to keep the ball rolling, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's an example, really, of decisions being made miles from where the action is on the whims of politicians. They're really listening to the intelligence that was coming back to them. They, so as they continue, why, when do they finally get to the point where they're actually willing to meet with him in Venlo? This is like months after the initial meeting, isn't it? Weeks, I think. It's sort of, oh, okay, okay. It, I think it proceeded it faster than I anticipated. Very quickly. Every meeting they had, they, they tried to draw the British closer to the border, saying that it was far too dangerous for them to come across, especially mm -hmm. generals. And they were sort of tying them along, kept making promises, never actually kept their promises, but Again, Best was being given promises and reporting it back, and Stevens was reporting it back. Then London was saying, oh, yeah, fine, keep going. This is good. This is good. We're getting somewhere. But across the way. Mm -hmm. So Fisher was starting to get out of his depth now. Because we're, you know, Schellenberg was involved. Fisher knew who Schellenberg was. He didn't like Schellenberg breathing down his neck. He started getting wobbles and he stopped going to the meetings. Said he was sick, he couldn't go, he was too ill. And probably Schellenberg was happy for that to happen because Fisher was not reliable and whatever was going to happen now, he wanted Fisher out of the way so they wouldn't mess things up. Mm -hmm. Schellenberg was still playing games, though. He actually brought one of his pals along to the next meeting, pretending to be another colonel, but this time in the army. He wasn't in the army. He was in the medical corps. So this second man started explaining how a coup would be carried out, the details of how the army would do it, how they would send the hit squad in to break through Hitler's uh, bodyguard, and either taken prisoner or or shooting, assassinating. So that was another little step along the along the way. But eventually they managed to persuade the British to come as far as Venlo. They said definitely the general's coming now, definitely but he's, there's no way that he's going to come into Holland. He was only prepared to step a few feet over the border and meet at a border post in Venlo. So now we come to the Venlo meeting. So they've successfully convinced these British officers to basically cross the border, even if they think it's just for a very short period of time, which is right where they need them so they can finally get hold of these guys, right? Well, there's a sort of a no man's land between the Dutch border post and the German border post. And there's a a hotel on this, in this no man's land. It's obviously a good place for people to move across the border before the war. Smuggling operations, that sort of thing. A, it was called the Cafe Bacchus, and it was, it was situated, I don't really know if it was Dutch soil, but I think it was probably Dutch soil because, but it was in between the two border posts. The only thing between Cafe Bacchus and Germany was a barrier at the German border post. It was, mm. I, th I think, about 20 or 30 meters from, from the border. So they agreed to go to Venlo. They went there on the 8th of November, had a meeting. Everything went off. Okay, except that no general, as usual. Agreed to go back on the 9th when there was definitely going to be a general there. There was a bit of a flap going on at the time. The Dutch had got word that a 
again the Germans had gone to England. So Stevens had decided that he should make a list of all his agents. This is how good he was. This is how good he was. He was going to make a list of all the agents, British agents, working in Holland, working to him, just in case he needed to contact them all quickly and tell them to get them out of the country if the Germans attacked. And he, oh my wrote, he wrote all these names on a piece of paper. He also had a telephone number which was the, the office number of the Dutch officer clock, which he was going to give to this German general when he showed up, so that he would have a direct line of contact when they started, when, when things started happening, or if he needed, if there was an emergency, if he needed the contact. This was the contact that he would be given. So he had all this list of British agents and he had club's telephone number on it. Do you know about how many names were on that list of agents? I don't have that information, I'm afraid. Hmm. <laughs> it was all of them in, in an entire country though, so that can't be good. All the ones that all the ones that were working to Stevens. Mm-hmm. He, was, he, was, he was in charge of operations in Hong my gosh, I have to imagine that he didn't mention this to anyone else because it seems like they would have dissuaded him. I think, him I think Best list. knew about it. And Best oh, told really? him. I think he told Best about it when they were driving in the car on their way. And Best he told him to throw it out of the window. <laughs> Get rid of it. Throw it away. We don't want... But Stevens didn't. For some reason. He probably thought, you know. I've got a lot of trouble to make this list. I'm not going to throw it out of the window. <laughs> right, right. You know. So what yeah. did happen once they actually arrived for this meeting? When they arrived for the meeting, there's a number of different versions of what happened. Basically what happened. Schellenberg was waiting at the cafe back as he'd got there. Best and Stevens were coming up, best had this huge motor car, a big Buick. And he brought along a chap called Lemons, who was actually his garage mechanic. Why he thought he'd been a garage mechanic, maybe he thought the Germans are playing games, I'm going to play games as well. <laughs> but he brought in this guy called Lemons, who was driving the car. Was he Belgian? Or... I think he was Belgian. Some people say he was working for the French, who put him there to keep an eye on things, but that's just supposition. Hmm. Best and Stevens in the back, Klopp in the passenger seat, Lemons driving. They drive into the car park, Cafe Bacchus. Schellenberg is standing on the veranda of the cafe. He's waving. They think, oh. He's waving at us. He's just being friendly. But of course he wasn't. On the other side of the border, he was he'd set up the hit squad. Now why had he done this? He'd done this because after the bomb went off in Munich, Hitler was furious. He wanted somebody's head on a plate. He wanted to, he wanted proof that it was the British who tried to kill him. So he told Himmler, find out who's behind this, find out who did it. Himmler told Heydrich, and Heydrich told Schellenberg. Now Schellenberg had this extremely unpleasant character working for him, a guy called Alfred Madjox. He was the sort of gangster that the SS would often use 
and unofficial operations on foreign soil, provocations, assassinations, all Bristol and Jocks knew. He'd been doing it for years. Well, Schellenberg had brought Nadjox in because that he brought Nadjox in because he'd agreed with Heydrich during the night that they were going to pick these two British agents up and prove that they had been part of the plot against Hitler. Because Hitler was desperate for any he, he wanted answers quickly and, and people were desperate to give him whatever answers they could find. If they could drag these two British agents in and say, oh, these, these guys have got something to do with it, that would sort of calm him down a little bit. So that, hmm. that was when Schellenberg had planned to, to kidnap them. And he'd got Nadjox involved. Nadjox had got some of his hooligans together. And around the time that Best and Stevens were driving into the car park at the Cafe Backers, Nadjox had two huge open topped cars, big running boards down both sides. And on these running boards, he had these hooligans, I think it was either 10 or 12 of these hooligans with machine guns, all standing either side of it. It was a bit like a, a 1920s Chicago gangster film, if you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And what they thought was a signal from Schellenberg, the best thought was a signal saying hi, was actually a signal to Nadjox saying move. So as soon as Best car came in and stopped. The barrier came up on the German border. The cars revved up. Nadjux jumped onto the car, and these two cars came screaming into the car park and pulled up behind Best's car. I think there was a couple of people firing guns in the air just to create panic. And they jumped out because they're on the running boards, they could get up quickly and move quickly, and they got the Best car opened the back doors, jumped in, slapped some handcuffs on Best and Stevens, did the same to Lemons. But Klopp wasn't going to hang about for that. Klopp jumped out of the car and tried to get away. He wasn't going to be taken by. He didn't, you know, it's one thing the British to get taken, another thing the British to be with a Dutch agent who was helping them, that would have been much worse. So he was desperate to get away, get back to the, uh, the Dutch border post, and to deter the, the mobs, the more the gangster mobs, he turned and fired at them. Because they returned fire, and there was a lot of them, and he, he was hit and he, he fell. He wasn't killed, but he died soon afterwards. So hmm. <clears throat> they dragged Stevens, Lemons, and Best out of the Buick, threw them into one of their own cars, picked Klopp up, threw him into the other car, turned round, and hightailed it back into Germany, probably all over in about two minutes. My uh, gosh. Anybody, if anybody on the, on the Dutch border post had seen it, it, by the time they realized what was going on, it was all done, it was all finished. So that's, that's really why Schellenberg sprung the trial. Best and Stevens went into German prison. We only have best version of what happened next. In his in the book that he wrote about it, I would say personally that his views are not all that reliable. There's a lot of things in there which make you question what he says. Stevens and Best were kept separate once they were taken to Germany. They were kept separate. I think they saw each other once 
fleetingly in passing, but they never actually met to speak while they were in captivity. And when Stevens, when Stevens was rescued at the end of the war, he never spoke publicly about the Venlo incident or about his time in German prison. Best, on the other hand, Best was a bit miffed about his treatment from British intelligence. He didn't think that they'd been supportive of him enough while he was in prison in Germany. And he was a bit miffed with them for getting him into the mess in the first place. <laughs> I can, I can understand why he would be so bitter about what happened. <laughs> so he he said, "Oh, well, I'm you know he was he'd been in prison for five years. He'd come out. He was he was broke. He, he had no business. He had no job, no money. He thought he would write a book about what had happened, make some money. MI six weren't happy about it. We didn't think they were going to let him write a book." So Best more said, well, you know, stop me. Hmm. Eventually they agreed to pay him a sum of money. I think Best says it was something like £6,000, which was quite a lot of money at the time, to keep quiet. But it's odd that he didn't keep quiet. He actually wrote the book. <laughs> he got the money and wrote the book, which makes... Me think anyway that he wrote the book in collaboration with MI6. So he told the story that MI6 wanted him to tell. I see. They probably, they probably suspected that whatever happened, Best was going to spill the beans one way or the other. He'd give interviews, drop hints, you know, make a bit of money here, sell his story there. So they probably thought that the best way to keep him quiet was to let him write the book, but with their connivance to make sure that he only said what mm -hmm. they wanted him to say. Yeah? Sure, sure, that makes perfect sense. Um, his book may not be the most reliable take on it, even if it's his own words. I, 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 I can't say that, but that's my view. Simply because of the, some of the things that he says, when he talks about interrogations, immediately after he'd been taken to Germany, he says in his book that there was no way he was going to stand up to torture, so he might as well tell them everything they wanted to know right from the start, because he's going to have to tell them in the end, and it's going to be pretty unpleasant for him in the meantime. So he's going to tell them straight away. But the thing is, oh well, I mean, that's, that's it's probably a reasonable thing to say. I don't know, I mean, how many people would, would uh, want to be in that situation. Mm -hmm. So when the interrogations start, according to Best, uh, they're quite farcical. Pompous little man who comes in with a little pitty moustache and making all sorts of bombastic threats about what he's going to do to Best if he doesn't talk and, and Best sort of laughs at him and, and this guy goes away and never sees him again. And other people come and interrogate him, but according to Best, they don't really interrogate him, they just, they're not proper interrogators. It's not a proper process and they don't ask him really ask him relevant questions and he says he doesn't give them any sort of information but what they really were interested in was Venlo. Schellenberg had picked them up because he wanted them implicated in the bomb. None of the interrogations were about the bomb. They wanted to know about Venlo. So best said, which is odd because if they wanted to know about Venlo, they should have asked Schellenberg. He was going to meet it. <laughs> he knew what was going on. So I think basically all they wanted Best and Stevens for was keep them on ice and use them at some point in the future 
there's evidence to say that they were part of the British bomb plot. Because the British had nothing to do with the bomb. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a single man called Elsa. He was a German. He, plant, he planted the bomb and planted it all himself. The British had nothing to do with it. But Hitler was determined to prove that they did. And Stevens and Best were kept in fairly comfortable circumstances, considering they were in the German prison for seven months, keep them in good order so that they could bring them out. And especially after 1940, when there was a chance that Germans were going to invade Britain. If they'd invaded, obviously, they were, if they could have got hold of Churchill, they would have put them on trial. They would have brought Best in and Stevens in and made them say, this, that, and the other about Churchill had planted this bomb and done this. So that's really, I think, what they, they were holding Best and Stevens for. You don't really know what Best and Stevens told them. Stevens didn't say anything about it at all. Stevens says he told them very little, and what little he told them, they probably knew anyway, because. He knew that the Germans had agents in Holland and they were getting information back all the time. But it's... So these, sorry? these guys were held for the entirety of the war. Was there ever any interest or, that you're aware of of trading them back for any no. of the captured German spies? Was that a, a common occurrence? No. Hmm. They didn't think they had any value at all, I don't think. It was certainly, oh, certainly best didn't mention at any time that it had been suggested to him that he might be traded back. As far as the British were concerned, Best and Stevens were a total embarrassment. They don't think they wanted them back. <laughs> they wanted to right, forget right. They wanted to, they, knew they, they knew that they were in prison in Germany. They knew they hadn't been killed because the Red Cross and various other organizations used to pass information backwards and forwards about prisoners. So they didn't really want Best and Stevens back in the middle of a war, <laughs> started telling stories about what had happened at Benio, that wouldn't have been very good for morale at all. So they were happy to leave them where they were, I think, provide, providing they weren't actually uh, under threat of being murdered. Hmm. Boy, so their war did... was over practically before it began. Sorry? Their war was over oh, practically before it began. Absolutely, yeah. Mangus MI6 didn't know what to think. Stevens had best have been taken alive. They knew that. I think Lemons had been, because Lemons was a Belgian or a Dutch citizen, he had been released by the Germans. They didn't keep him. They let him go. So he would have, no doubt, told the British best and Stevens had been taken alive. And that probably couldn't tell them much more than that. So Mengus mm -hmm. didn't know what best and Stevens had said. He didn't know what the Germans knew. He had to assume that best and Stevens had told them everything. I think Stevens must have talked because. There is some evidence that by the end of 1939, the Germans knew about the Z organization, uh, which they probably could only have got from Best. Hmm. One doesn't know for sure, but it's a fair supposition that he told them about the Z operation, the Z organization. Interesting. But certainly, none of their agents could be trusted now. They didn't know if the Germans would have, could have turned them. If they were sending back false information, etc. Right. So everybody on that list that Stevens carried with him was done one way or the other because either Absolutely. they could be captured yeah. or killed or they could be turned. So there was really completely useless no matter what at that point. Pull them out, yeah, completely. Do you happen to know if any of them were killed or captured or, or did they, were they just disregarded by British intelligence after that? I don't have any information about that. Yeah. I know that. Yeah, I can um, see why they would go hands off. Yeah. I know that once Churchill took the reins in 
May 1940, he had absolutely no faith in MI6 operations whatsoever. And he set up completely new organizations, MI9, SOE, with different personnel, different leadership, different objectives. So I know MO6 did pick themselves up and they did during the war. So during the war they did operate with credit, but certainly at the end of 1939 they were pretty much a spent force. Hmm. My gosh. Yeah, just kind of gutted that organization, that enormous embarrassing failure right at the beginning there. Yeah. Well, so it, it wasn't a good start for the British. <laughs> no, no, certainly not. But in the end, I mean, they, they rallied in a big way. And I know that there were many, many future successes, not necessarily for the people involved in the Venlo incident, yeah. but a lot of good things came out of it. Ultimately, did the organization just have to go through growing pains or was it just a matter of getting rid of the old crew and bringing in new people as the situation changed? Or was it something else, you think? I would have thought there were a lot of new people, especially after Churchill. Churchill would have made sure that he had cleared out to Oh, yeah, I can, I can certainly imagine. Yeah. It was, Amazing. Yeah. That's about well, it. Yeah, it's quite a fascinating story, and it's it's got so many important lessons that we can learn about the failure of an intelligence operation and so many hallmarks that have happened many, yeah. many other times throughout Happy history. Again and again, haven't they? over the years, over the decades, over the centuries, really, where there's a lot of signs that things are not as they should be, but they're not put together because of the priority placed on this information and this opportunity that really is just too good to be true. I mean, I'm thinking right now at this very famous event in 2009 in Afghanistan, when a number of CIA personnel were killed by a source who wore a suicide vest to a meeting with them, unfortunately. And I think we've talked about it before and a lot of people are very familiar with that incident, but it's got so many echoes with this one. It really is amazing how these kind of things repeat themselves over and over again. But Norm, I, I really enjoyed this book quite a bit. I thought I knew a lot about the Venlo incident, honestly, before I read the book, and yet I learned a ton about it from you. So thank you for putting that all together. Are you okay. working on another book right now? I am, yes. Art and Architecture as Propaganda in the Third Reich is my current project. Oh, um, wow. That sounds very interesting. Arts and architecture as propaganda. Hmm. Yeah. Well, when um, do you anticipate having that one out? Do you already have a publication date or is it still in the draft stage? I'm about halfway right through writing it at the moment. I'm still researching it and writing it. Okay. Um, yeah, that sounds like an ambitious project, honestly, but very interesting. Well, I only write books that I'm interested in. <laughs> because I don't, you know, I don't have to write. I don't do it for the money. I, I do, people don't tell me what I have to write. I just whatever, whatever I get interested in, then I just research it, research it, and then sometimes there's enough for a book, and sometimes there isn't. Hmm. But this one, there's, there's more than enough for a book. I mean, it's a fascinating subject. Great, great. I'm yeah. looking forward to that. And that's a terrific position to be in where you don't have to do it. You're not under any pressure to publish or anything yeah. like that. So it's done when you're done with it and every you can publish on whatever you publish. Every book I write is an education for me. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, yeah. I'm really looking forward to that, Norn. I definitely want to stay in contact after this. Do you have any public social media or anything like that if people want to look you up after they listen to this interview? I don't, but my granddaughter is going to set me up with some. <laughs> oh, wonderful. <laughs> Good. Well, a little bit of a double-edged sword there, I promise, but I'm sure that people will be interested in getting updates from you and that kind of thing after they hear this interview and after they read one or two of your books. So that, that would be helpful, I'm sure, if she can help you manage all of that. Yeah, she, she's studying media management at the university, so she's, it's a little uh, project for her to practice her new skills. Great. Great. Okay. Well, you've got my email now. We've been in touch quite a bit lately. So just let me know when that is up and I will share it with people so they can get some updates on your books in the future then. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time, Norm. I really appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to reading some more of your writing. So let's definitely stay in touch. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Norm. Bye. If you're interested in more of Spycraft 101, look for my page on Instagram at Spycraft 101. 
You can also find more great articles on my website, spycraft101.com. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll stick around because there is lots more to come. Disclaimer. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The stories and statements expressed herein are experiences and opinions. They may not reflect the views of the host or the production studio. It's okay if you disagree with our content. No piece of media is right for everyone. If you love Spycraft 101, please check us out online, on Instagram, on YouTube, and especially on Patreon. Thank you for listening.